Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this series. I'm really impressed with the, the set of people in your past and future uh, uh, speakers for this series, and I'm honored to be part of that August group. So I, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of terrific PhD students, graduate students at Michigan, and uh, every time I give a talk, I have to pick uh, one of the many great things going on in my group. And I wanted to talk about this joint optimization work today. Uh, it's been very recently uh, accepted in, in uh, transactions on medical imaging. Uh, and so I'm pretty excited to tell you about it. So this is really the work of Guanhua Wang, which is a PhD student that I co-advised with Doug Knoll. And I want to acknowledge his uh, crucial contributions. And these little pictures here are kind of a preview of the kind of case-based trajectories I'm going to be talking about in this seminar. So there's an overview of the talk. I'm going to I was uh, asked to sort of present this to a pretty broad audience, so you'll see it's it's probably very broad uh, initially, and then I'll get into the more details of some MRI-specific stuff as we go on. So talking kind of at a high level about machine learning and imaging and MRI case-based sampling, uh, how you combine those things together, and then really getting into the, the meat of it, which is the joint optimization of the case-based sampling and the reconstruction method. All right, so I, hopefully everybody who's attending this seminar series is aware that basically what happens in medical imaging is we design some kind of scan, we collect data, we put that raw data through some kind of reconstruction algorithm, producing images that we view or process in some way to uh, ultimately make some kind of diagnosis or interpretation. And there's really many places to put machine learning on uh, in this pipeline. The, the most obvious place, especially if you think about the, the history of machine learning coming out of like computer vision and so on, is to, is to put it in the image processing stage after the images have been reconstructed to do segmentation or diagnosis and so on directly from the reconstructed images. And there's been lots of special images and journals devoted to that topic and lots of conferences and so on. Um, it's perhaps less common, but it's a, a growing interest recently to actually use machine learning even in the process of designing the scan itself. So in, in MRI, this could be uh, choosing the best case space phase encoding locations, for example. This is a pretty hot topic recently in MRI, but it actually has roots going back almost 30 years to some early work uh, from Yui Tsao and David Levin um, on choosing the best phase encode locations uh, based on some fixed reconstruction algorithm. Um, so that work was kind of ahead of the machine learning craze, but now, now more recently, there's been lots of people uh, working on this topic. Um, of course, there's also lots of people applying machine learning in the image reconstruction process. There was uh, four years ago, a special issue of the IEEE transactions on medical imaging devoted to this topic using machine learning. Um, almost all the papers in that use deep learning. In fact, there's been surveys on this topic. Uh, of course, APFL was one of the pioneers in applying machine learning to the reconstruction process, Michael Unser's group. Um, and in some sense, I think this is an easier place, a little bit easier uh, than doing diagnosis with machine learning, because, you know, if you, you look at a sinogram with your eyes, you can't do diagnosis, but you could perhaps develop machine learning methods to, to process that effectively. Whereas when you process images with machine learning techniques, you are competing with a very well-trained uh, radiologist eyes. Um, there is a little bit of work on trying to go directly from the raw data through some kind of magic machine learning method to diagnosis. I've seen uh, papers on taking the raw data, the raw sinograms and CT and going directly to um, estimates of the diameter of vessels, for example. And there's probably work that I uh, have overlooked uh, going directly from case space to some kind of diagnosis in the MRI field. There's new papers coming out every day in archives, so I can't claim I'm up on every single one. Uh, but what this talk now, now that I've given you that overview, what this talk is going to focus on is using machine learning to on in these two colored boxes to jointly design the acquisition aspects of a MRI scan, specifically the case space sampling and the reconstructed images. And this paper, there's the archive link here. And this is this paper has just come out in IEEE transactions on medical imaging. And again, uh, we're, what we're doing here is we're starting with some initial nominal case-based sampling patterns, such as radial sampling, and then optimizing it in an end-to-end -end way, and as well as optimizing the, the parameters of a machine learning-based reconstructed image um, to, to end up with uh, some supervised learning of case-based trajectories. And here are some citations to some related work. 
Um, this work was Cartesian sampling, and this work was also non-Cartesian sampling. So just to back up a little bit and talk about sampling in MRI. So in MRI, as I'm sure most of you know, we sample the Fourier transform of the objects. So we call that sampling in K space. And, and most clinical MRI scans use Cartesian sampling. And then after you collect data like this, you simply do an inverse FFT and get the reconstructed image. There have been many variations of that over time. Um, uh, collecting only part of case space and then using some prior information to fill in the rest of case space or under sampling and using information from multiple coils or prior information to make up for that. And then there's, these are all examples of a Cartesian trajectories, right? The points are subsets of the DFT sample locations. There's also non-Cartesian trajectories that can have certain advantages in terms of scan time and robustness to um, uh, motion artifacts and things like that. They also have certain challenges associated with the hardware that go with them, but th these, these are used, just not as widely clinically. Um, once you undersample, you need more advanced reconstruction methods to, to make up somehow for the sort of missing data when you don't fully sample case space. And that has led to enormous amount of research on advanced reconstruction methods to, to, to make up for, compensate for that missing data. And these days, a lot of those advanced methods um, are based on deep learning. So let me first, and we're going to be using a deep learning based method. So let me comment on the different ways you can apply deep learning uh, to the image reconstruction process. So this is still at the tutorial level here. And I've got pictures that go with each of them. So the, the simplest approach and the approach that APFL started with with CT with the FBP nets several years ago is to take your whatever kind of raw data you have, a sinogram and CT or case space and MRI, put it through a fast reconstruction method to give an image that is going to suffer from some sort of artifacts because of the, the noise or the limited sampling of the data, and then use a neural network to try to clean up, reduce those artifacts and noise. Um, this is the fastest approach to applying to deep learning to image reconstruction, the fastest computational pipeline. Um, it has the challenge that when you have aliasing artifacts like the streaks in filter back projection or the aliasing artifacts in undersampling MRI, those are quite widespread throughout the image. They're not just local effects. And so you need a you need a pretty deep network that has a pretty large receptive field to clean up those artifacts that really span many pixels across the image. And let me just comment a little bit about the, the uh, a cautionary note about using uh, image domain deep learning. This is work from a former postdoc, a former PhD student of mine who did a postdoc at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is a, an institute in New York that has lots and lots of scans of people with cancer, lots of brain scans. This was presented a couple of years at a workshop on data, on data sampling and image reconstruction. And uh, they trained a neural network uh, to work on the image domain, right? Take the undersampled images, reconstruct them, and then try to clean up the aliasing artifacts. Uh, and they trained this on a large set of brain scans, most of which had tumors in them, right? This is a cancer center, so they have lots and lots of MRI scans with tumors. And then a patient came along who had a very rare uh, malignant brain tumor that you can see in this fully sampled image. And when they retrospectively undersampled that image, that the case based data, excuse me, of that image, and put it through a compressed sensing style reconstruction, they got a perfectly reasonable reconstruction out of that. When they put it through an image domain deep learning method, they got this reconstructed image shown in the upper right here that uh, where you can barely see this uh, rare malignant brain tumor. And this is despite having trained with lots of examples of brain images with tumors in them. Um, and so the, I guess sometimes we worry about hallucinations of a deep learning method making uh, features that aren't there. In some sense, this is an anti-hallucination or whatever. It's, it's losing information. And so that's a cautionary note about trying to do all of the uh, processing solely in the image domain. Now, there's been various variations of this. Instead of relying solely on the neural network to, to be your final reconstruction in the image, you could take the output of the neural network and use that as a kind of regularizer and then go back and revisit the data, right? So find an image that fits the data. So my notation Y is the case-based data here. A is the system matrix that describes the, um, the physics of the imaging system. X is the unknown image that you're trying to reconstruct. So here we would be finding, trying to find an image that both fits the data and is also somewhat consistent with the output of the neural network. And word another way, if in a simple single coil MRI, if you have um, undersampled data here, basically this would end up 
this minimization uh, in the limit as beta goes to zero would actually take the measured case space points that you have and combine that with the Fourier transform of the output of the neural net and put those two together and then do a uh, combined inverse FFT basically. So that's a way of thinking about is basically using the neural network only to fill in the missing parts of case space and then using the, the being true to the measured data in your final reconstruction. Now, the drawback of this approach is it does take more compute time because now you're going to have to do, in general, for multi-coil MRI or for non-Cartesian sampling, you'll need to do iterative methods to uh, efficiently solve this matrix inverse. Um, there are also techniques that work purely in the measurement day. Take your raw data, whether it's a sinogram or case space, put it through a neural network to try and clean up or fill in the missing data, and then finally put it through a fast reconstruction method. So these methods, again, are, have the benefit of being fast, um, but maybe it's kind of hard to see subtle image features in a sinogram or in case space. So I think they're probably not the optimal family of methods, but there, there have been uh, publications along that line as well. There's also sort of the I don't know if holy grail is the right word, but methods that go directly from the raw case based data to the reconstructed image, um, perhaps having the potential to avoid any issues with model mismatch, but these require uh, very large memory requirements because uh, the relationship between a point and say a sinogram or case space in an image is, it's kind of every point in case space affects the entire image. So you need very large receptive fields, uh, hard to generalize this to 3D or 3D plus dynamic imaging. So there have been a lot of competitions uh, in the couple, last couple of years on machine learning based reconstruction methods and the in general typically the methods that win those competitions are methods that combine the physics of the imaging system with a neural network based method for cleaning up artifacts in the image so instead of just reconstructing once and then applying a neural network to that reconstruction these methods iteratively uh, do some kind of reconstruction, then use a neural network to try and clean that up and then go back and revisit the data again and do that several times. These methods go by various names such as deep unrolling or unrolled loop algorithms. Uh, and so in this way, the, the, the neural network is really sort of playing the role of a regularizer, but a, a regularizer that's learned from training data rather than handcrafted. So again, this takes more computation, but this is the family of methods that has tended to lead, uh, give the best um, image quality at least by the metrics that we're using these days in these competitions, um, and maybe is a little bit more interpretable as well. And that is the kind of reconstruction method I'm gonna use in the, in the results that come later. There's a recent survey paper. I, what I've just summarized barely scratches the surface of this incredibly hot field. So this recent survey paper has this whole taxonomy that I'm sure you can't read of different uh, families of methods uh, with GANs and various techniques. So this is a very active research area with a lot of techniques. I think we're still somewhat in the early days. All right, so with that background, I'm gonna get a little bit more into the process of learning the sampling patterns in MRI. So, um, most of the literature has been focused on pre-specified image reconstruction methods. So you fix the reconstruction method, and then you do some sort of optimization of the case-based sampling. So that early work from 1993 was where they were selecting phase encoding locations, had a, what they called feature recognizing MRI, um, had a fixed reconstruction method. And there's been, been other work along those lines as well with various fixed compressed sensing style reconstruction or, or dictionary learning. That's not DL, that's dictionary learning. That's before the 20, 2011, that was before the deep learning craze back when DL meant dictionary learning. Uh, di a dictionary learning reconstruction method, again, optimizing Cartesian sampling patterns. Uh, an, another Swiss group from ATH uh, worked on optimizing uh, 2D uh, phase encoding locations as well for single coil MRI, again, for various specific reconstruction methods. More recently, you know, in the last, say, four years or so, there have been work on trying to jointly learn the, the, the sampling pattern MRI, as well as some parameters of the reconstruction algorithm. Um, so again, the, the group from ATH has, has uh, pursued uh, Cartesian sampling uh, optimization in that sense. Uh, the group from uh, Iowa, also has looked at Cartesian sampling uh, jointly with optimizing an unrolled loop kind of reconstruction algorithm. 
Cornell has done this, a uh, group in France as well. Uh, that, they started looking at non-Cartesian sampling there, uh, there with a UNET-based reconstruction method. So again, an in, pure image domain reconstruction method. So what distinguishes the work I'm going to talk about today is we are doing non-Cartesian sampling, which has been relatively rare in this previous work, and we're using an unrolled loop kind of iterative algorithm. Uh, increasing the quality, but also increasing the complexity. And I'll talk a little bit about how we managed to bring some efficient Jacobian approximations into this process so that we could back propagate all the way through an unrolled loop kind of reconstruction method, all the way back to the MRI sampling pattern that we're optimizing. Here's an, an example of some previous work, uh, actually from the ATH group, Volkacheva's group, of um, optimizing sampling for a specific reconstruction method. This was a basis pursuit based uh, kind of compressed sensing reconstruction method with a shearlet transform as a handcrafted regularizer. Um, and so there's a set of training data here and they're uh, optimizing uh, the, the phase encode locations in a Cartesian way. So th this, is, this direction here is called the phase encoding location. This is the readout direction. So it's, uh, and this is, a very common way to sample an MRI. So collect some, choose some locations along this axis and then quickly read out along this axis. And what I found interesting when I read this paper is that, so this is an optimized sampling pattern. You notice that so zero is the, the, DC is the center of this and it's increasing frequency as we go up and down. It's kind of curious that this optimized design basically didn't recommend collecting any samples in the bottom, you know, the top third or bottom third of K space. Um, and I think that's because this early work used PSNR, or mean squared error, as the loss function for training. And it's known now that that loss function is kind of insensitive to high frequency. So it's kind of maybe unsurprising that the optimal sampling pattern that came out of that work chose to emphasize low spatial frequencies instead of high spatial frequencies. And, and you can see the, the reconstructed images have some noticeable loss of spatial resolution because of that um, probably the use of mean squared error type loss function. But this was really pioneering early work on trying to optimize the sampling pattern in a supervised or machine learning type of way. All right, so with that background, let me talk a little bit about our work. Um, so here's the notation again. Y is the measured case space data, X is the image re reconstruct. There's always noise in the data. And our system matrix here is a function of omega, the sampling pattern, the case space sampling. And just to give you a sense of numbers here, the, we're collecting between 10 and 30,000 data points. So that's the length of this vector. Um, the case space trajectory will be a, a it, we're going to focus on 2D in this presentation. So that's a, a, a sampling pattern with probably several thousand points along it, uh, in along the KX and KY dimensions. The image that we're going to construct has on the order of 100,000 parameters. This system matrix is too large to store explicitly. We use the non-uniform FFT method that Michael mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So with that measurement model, we're going to have a reconstruction method that takes the raw case-based data and, of course, knowledge of the, the sampling pattern. We know that. It's something we specify in the imaging system. And then reconstruction method is going to have its own set of learnable parameters, so CNN weights, for example. Uh, the specific CNN we're using is something called the deep iterative down up uh, CNN, which is a, at the time we started this work, at least was a state of the de, state of the art denoising uh, CNN. It has, you know, over 100 million learnable parameters. So the, the, the number of unknowns here is dominated by the number of parameters in the neural network compared to the relatively small number of unknowns in the case space trajectory. And our goal is to optimize both the case space sampling pattern and the CNN weights so that the output of this reconstructed image is close to the latent image, the true image X, as possible, measured somehow. And we used a training loss function that's a combination of the two norm and the one norm because it's known that the one norm, including the one norm here, gives us um, uh, more sensitivity to the high spatial frequencies, so we don't lead to as much uh, resolution loss doing that. So we, we start with uh, fully sampled training images, and we set up an optimization problem that looks like this. So we have, we're, we're averaging over all the training images, and we have this loss where we're comparing the reconstructed image that comes out of a simulated case-based data. So for each training data, 
And for each candidate case-based trajectory, we simulate case-based data, add some noise to that, and then reconstruct it with our method that has learnable parameters in it, and then compare that to the, the training example. So that is the, that really is the joint optimization problem for jointly learning the case-based trajectory and the CNN parameters. Jeff, someone uh, raised their hands. Okay, yeah, I didn't, I, you know, I closed the chat window. So, oh, actually I don't, I don't, oh, raised your hand. Okay, I don't see anything in chat. Go ahead, please ask a question. Okay, so uh, I can I allow to talk. So Alexi, you have a question? I think you can unmute yourself. Yeah, no, sorry for me, it was a mistake. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry but someone else actually. But someone before, I guess, yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, Go ahead. But uh, I mean, anyone is welcome to do that. So it's, it's working. Absolutely. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just keep going full speed ahead. Is there a question right now? No, you're all set. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's easy to confuse the raise hand and the applause button. So I understand. I see. No problem. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So I think I was about to say we're using this model-based deep learning method from the Iowa group for, as the reconstruction method here. Uh, it's an unrolled loop algorithm uh, with this particular denoising CNN in it. Um, I've shown it here as if we've the number of terms in the sum is the number of training images, but we actually are adding synthetic noise ourselves, complex noise like we have in MRI. So we could add multiple realizations for each training image to have even more terms in our loss if we wanted to. Now I've written it here as an unconstrained uh, optimization problem, but that's not true. We actually have constraints on the case-based sampling pattern. MRI scanners, the gradient amplifiers, they have a maximum amplitude, and there is a, a constraint on how fast um, you can, you can uh, the, the, the second derivative of that, the slew rate as a constraint as well. So we have built both of those constraints into this optimization process, uh, actually using a regularizer rather than constraint. So strong penalty function that um, ensures that we end up with case-based trajectories that are actually feasible for implementing on the hardware. And Mike will be pleased to know that as part of the optimization process, we actually use B splines to parameterize the case based trajectory uh, in a course defined search that I'll elaborate on later. Really, this is an incredibly non convex optimization problem, and it's very helpful to do this in a course defined way. And using B splines is helpful for that. Uh, it's also helpful uh, the fact that the second derivative of B splines is easy to compute, relates to other order splines, is, is very helpful for enforcing the slew rate constraints as well. After we've optimized the trajectory, we actually go back and measure it on the scanner to correct for something called eddy currents. What the scanner actually plays is not exactly what you program it to do, and so we account for that in our final reconstructed images. And as I already mentioned, I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on this, so I'll just skip that for now. Here is a pictorial version of what I just had in equations there, all right? So we have a bunch of training images that came from fully sampled data. Uh, we're jointly learning the case-based trajectory and the parameters of the CNN. So for each candidate trajectory and set of CNN parameters, we take the training images, propagate them through our model for the imaging system with an NUFFT, add noise, getting simulated case space. Okay, so now let me tell you a little more about the reconstruction. We have found it helpful to first apply a standard kind of reconstruction method before we start the iterations with the CNN. So we actually do a, quad, a penalized least squares reconstruction, a regularized least squares reconstruction with a quadratic regularizer, very classic um, um, reconstruction method from probably four decades ago or whatever to give us a good initial image. If we just did zero filling of case space and inverse FFT, you get a very lousy image and then you need more iterations of this to clean it up. So we, we start with a good, so there, I think there's still a role to learning about classic reconstruction methods because they're, if nothing else, they're useful as initializers. And then we have some number of iterations of this is the modal, the model-based deep learning of a CNN denoiser followed by a data consistency step, data consistency step finally leading to a reconstructed image that we compare with our loss function with the fully sampled training data. And then that's what we use to optimize the loss. And then finally at test time, we put a patient in the scanner. We actually take the learned trajectory, which might like something like this, uh, collect case-based data in the scanner, and then put it through the exact same reconstruction method, including the good initializer to produce the reconstructed image. So that's 
Uh, an acronym here is something like B spline joint optimization reconstruction. I forget what the K is. Is it on the previous slide back here? Okay, whatever. And Bjork is the acronym. In MRI, you have to have an acronym. The training data come, came from the NYU fast MRI data set. We use both brains and knee data sets. We initialized with either radial lines um, or I think there's some spirals as well. Um, a little bit more details for those who uh, are interested in MRI specifics. And we compared to something called the sparkling method from, from the, uh, the group in Paris that uses a pre-specified density of samples then optimize the trans trajectory based on that pre-specified density. So one of the interesting things that we found from this is that the learned trajectory is different for different anatomies. So the knee images that I might show you later um, are very much elongated. So they have more frequency components in one direction or another, and you end up with the K-space trajectory kind of emphasizing one of the directions more than others. So this is the KX and KY, the, um, the spatial frequency space here. Sorry for the lack of axis labels. Whereas brain images are a little bit more isotropic, and so you end up with something that looks a little bit closer to the radial sampling pattern that we started with. Um, this is an example of the radial pattern that we started with, and we can take that radial pattern and do a inverse FFT of it to get a kind of a point spread function. And we can do that as well with the sparkling trajectory as well as our optimized trajectory. And I don't know how well it is to easy to see over Zoom here, but the sparkling trajectory has a little bit uh, wider center lobe um, and you can see a, a narrower center lobe here. And I don't know, maybe you can judge for yourself about the amount of sort of aliasing artifacts in the tails of the sparkling trajectory compared to the um, Bjork R optimized trajectory. Certainly the radial sampling has a, a lot of heavy uh, uh, aliasing artifacts in the tails of the point spread function. Uh, and here's numbers to go with that. So the full width F maximum of that of the center of the point spread function. This is now for 32 spokes. It's 1.5 for radial, 2.1 for sparkling, and 1.6 for Bjork. All right, so this is showing it now with 32 spokes. Again, comparing radial, sparkling, and our optimized so-called Bjork trajectory here. They, they look pretty funky. One interesting thing uh, that came out of this, so the, the training data from the fast MRI data set is complex images, so they're not real, they don't have conjugate symmetry, but the phase is typically smooth, and so you have a kind of approximate conjugate symmetry in K-space, and interestingly, the um, trajectories that our method learned, if you take them and flip them around in X and Y to see are they uh, exploiting that possible conjugate symmetry in the data, they, they approximately are. So the, the solid line here is the learned trajectory, and then the dashed line is the learned trajectory flipped in X and Y and then shown on top of it. And you can see that the, the flipped versions are approximately filling in, you know, halfway in between the learned trajectory. So that means it sort of has learned that the data is approximately conjugate symmetric without us building that into the optimization problem at all. It's, it's, it's in the learning process. Okay, so we took that learned trajectory and I wanna remind you that those trajectories were learned from brains and knees, not from any phantoms, but the first thing we did is we tested it with a phantom, you know, plastic object that we put in the scanner. Um, and the top row shows the reconstructions using compressed sensing type of reconstruction method. And the bottom row shows uh, these unrolled neural network kind of reconstructions. So, and then the columns here are showing, well, sir, over here is the fully sampled rate of data. So that's sort of the ground truth. And then this column is using the original radial undersampling pattern. The second column is using the sparkling sampling pattern that I showed you back here. And then this third column here is showing our jointly optimized reconstruction. Um, it's notable here that, um, this compressed sensing reconstruction looks closer to the ground truth than the prior sampling methods, even though there was no compressed sensing reconstruction in our training. We were using the unrolled neural network as our training method. And so un unsurprisingly, that jointly optimized image is the one that looks the closest to the ground truth because it's been jointly optimized. Well, maybe it is a little bit surprising because again, we trained on brains and knees. We did not train on phantoms. So this was a maybe a pleasant surprise to see how well this worked in a phantom. 
Uh, here it is applied to a brain. So this is real data now from the scanner. Compressed sensing reconstructions on the top, unrolled neural network on the bottom. Here's the full radial sampling for comparison. And there's still quite a bit of residual aliasing artifacts in all the compressed sensing reconstructions, but the unrolled ne neural network, especially with the optimized sampling, I think you can agree is got the reduced, I hope you can see over Zoom that this has reduced the aliasing the most. Um, you know, there is some loss of resolution still, and that's that's because this is only 16 shots, right? So this is quite heavily undersampled. If this is too blurry for clinical use, then one should use more than 16 shots. Uh, neural networks cannot work magic. You're never going to reconstruct full sampling with only 16 shots, no matter how much uh, machine learning you throw at it. Uh, here's here's uh, maybe better results with 32 shot data, um, so less less aggressively undersampled. Again, same layout, and the our jointly optimized sampling produces the best results and produces you know pretty good results even with a compressed sensing type reconstruction. All right, so those were pictures. We've also evaluated this quantitatively, both in terms of uh, so the SSIM metric as well as PSNR, and in both cases, um, the jointly optimized reconstruction produces the the best quality in terms of both of those metrics, uh, even for compressed sensing type reconstruction that it wasn't optimized for. But the, the highest number, of course, is when you use the unrolled neural network combined with the jointly optimized sampling pattern. Um, I, I alluded to this earlier, I'm just saying it mathematically now, that all gradient amplifiers have limits on their maximum amplitude and on their slew rate, and so those constraints are built in using a regularizer. We, in fact, use a ReLU-like function that rises rapidly above the constraint, uh, and so that we can just throw that into the atom optimizer that does fast subgradient-based optimization. So Jeff, we, we have a question on the chat. Yeah. So on slide 31, could you comment on the shadow appearing on the left side of the brain? Using... Up you are. The, sh the shadow. So let me see here. Um, by left. So I don't know if this is. Uh, <laughs> so I assume you're referring over here somewhere. I'm not sure which. Um, if this is a slide 31. Yes. So. Um, in oh, no, in this call. Scalp. Oh, yes, I think the, the one on the border. Um, oh, oh, this here, maybe this. Ah, yeah, that's an interesting. Um, yes, okay, yeah. Uh, so I'm, let's see, I, yeah, and it also appears in the compressed sensing reconstruction. So uh, if Guanwa, if you're here, if you want to comment. So I actually don't know the origins of that. There is, there is going to be residual aliasing in all of these. Yeah, it's interesting. It actually is more noticeable in the, uh... oh, Guanwa has commented. Okay, that, so. I, I can give him, yeah. he's asking for so he, he's understand. commented. So there is a, so first of all, I should mention, we use, I think the eSpirit method uh, uh, from Mickey Lustig's group to estimate the, sensitivity maps. And so that provides a support constraint for these. And I actually want the support constraint to be bigger than brain. I, I fear that if we hug the support constraint too tightly, um, any model mismatch effects end up inside the head. I actually prefer my sensitivity maps to be a bit bigger than brain so that um, uh, any model mismatch will hopefully spill into the background and be an evidence of some some model mismatch. So I would I would view that as a possible evidence of a model mismatch. And uh, I don't know if Guan Hua can unmute and comment any more than that. Um, I think yeah, I guess the reason is that the sensitivity map is a little bit larger than the object. So that's where the so-called shadow comes from. Yeah, it's it's just noticeable that it's it's worse in Bjork than sparkling, and I had not I had not in this this one as well. I mean, there's some signs of it out here. Um, you know, the sensitivity map estimation process itself is always imperfect, so there's always model mismatch there. And the more aggressively you undersample, the more likely I think that such um, model mismatch artifacts are going to appear somewhere. So thanks for the question. That's a very keen eyes, good observation. Uh, okay, fortunately, with 32 spokes, it's a little less noticeable. Maybe there's a, a hint of it out here. 
in both of these images, interestingly, as well as over here. Okay, I, was, I think I was here. All right, um, I mentioned uh, with words before, here's pictures to show the benefits of the course to fine uh, relaxation process. So we start by heavily decimating the sampling trajectory. So a, a relatively smaller number of B-spline coefficients to model the X and Y coordinates of the case space trajectory. And we iterate for a while, and then we go to a finer parameterization and so on, just like people did with these splines with image pyramids for image compression and other image processing techniques. But here we're doing it uh, in modeling the case-based trajectories. And by comparison, if you um, just start by modeling every single sample of the case-based trajectory and try to run Adam, you know, stochastic gradient descent directly on that, you find that it doesn't move very far. It really gets stuck in a bad local minimum. So doing this course defined search in this incredibly um, non-convex optimization problem has proven to be very, very helpful. Uh, this is just a little bit more details about the reconstruction method, the model-based deep learning reconstruction method that alternates between a data fitting term uh, and then a regularizer. So let, let, let me, just for those of you who are not familiar with this, how am I doing on time here? Uh, I think I'm okay. Um, if you started with a regularization, uh, a regularized reconstruction method like we typically have with compressed sensing, one way to solve that is by ADMM, where you introduce an auxiliary variable that separates the regularizer from the data fit term. And then once you do that, you can alternate between updating the image X and the auxiliary variable. And in classical ADMM-based reconstruction, this would be a proximal operation, proximal mapping operation step. Uh, basically, in these unrolled loop algorithms, you simply replace that with a denoising algorithm, because that's essentially what this step would be doing in classical uh, reconstruction, model-based reconstruction methods. So you, you replace that handcrafted regularizer with a learned regularizer that's parameterized by some weights that you learn in a supervised way. And in the results I've been showing you, we used six outer iterations, six uh, alternations between a data consistency update that uses the output of the neural network and then passing that image through the neural network to kind of denoise it. Okay, so one really important thing for making this practical to do this end-to-end -end learning where we have a loss function over here and we want to learn the case-based trajectory is um, an efficient way to back propagate through all of the places where we use the system matrix A that depends on the case based trajectory. So it appears both in this data consistency term and in this regularized reconstruction step. So if I just focus on the data reconstruction step, the case consistency step, you know, that that looks something like this if you run a, a gradient descent step there, for example. So it depends on the system matrix that it term depends on the learn the case based trajectory that we're learning. Uh, now, to implement that, we use the non-uniform fast Fourier transform, and that's a that's a computational procedure. And in, in principle, you could try to just do back propagation through that. It turns out that's incredibly slow. There's so many detailed operations in that NUFFT that if you just turn on auto diff and try to let it do it automatically, it is very slow. Uh, so instead, what we've done is we mathematically analyze what is the Jacobian of applying our system model to a current guess of the image. We write down analytically, so that's just a little bit of calculus to, to analyze what that Jacobian is. And then once you've done that analytically, you can implement that Jacobian efficiently using the non-uniform fast Fourier transform. All right, so we first do the derivative on paper, and then we implement that derivative using the non-uniform fast Fourier transform to make it fast instead of just implementing the NUFFT and making the auto diff code do it all for you. So there's a little bit more pencil and paper work on our part, um, but it saves a lot of time on the computation. Uh, and it and as well as memory, I should say, because uh, the, the auto diff uh, back propagation ends up um, building up memory along as you back propagate through multiple iter iterations of the iterative algorithms. Uh, we do this not only for like the matrix vector multiplication, but even for the step where we're applying conjugate gradient. So uh, let me go back a second here. This step right here can be solved using conjugate gradient. You can also write down analytically what the solution is. It's, it involves A transpose A plus 
constant times identity, the inverse of that matrix. And you can write down analytically what the Jacobian of that is with respect to the case space trajectory parameters. You write that down analytically and then you implement it efficiently with an NUFFT. Um, and uh, so I think I'll, we found that using that leads to uh, a better results and faster and lower memory and so on. So I think I'll just comment on that. Uh, so in summary, I hope you've gotten from this talk that machine learning methods, I'm sure you know already, have a lot of potential. You knew that already for image processing and image reconstruction, but I think also for optimizing scan designs. Um, the quantitative results, I think, show the, the benefit of both optimizing, optimizing both together, both the scan design and the image reconstruction. The fact that we get um, different optimization for knees and brains is interesting. You know, there's a practical issue there because MRI scanners have thousands of trajectories that you can use. And it's not clear to me that it, or it's thousands of different protocols that you can use. And it, it's probably not practical, practical to separately optimize trajectories for every single protocol. On the other hand, I showed you results on a phantom image that was completely different than the data that we was used to optimize these trajectories. So I think there is hope for developing techniques that generalize beyond this very specific set of images that was used to optimize. Uh, our ultimate interest is actually in dynamic imaging, fMRI. In a dynamic imaging, you never can get fully sampled data. People will talk about fully sampled, but it's never really fully sampled because the object is changing as you sample every case space point is its own slice in time. And so we really need self-supervised methods for dealing with situations where we don't have any or enough training data. Everything I've shown you today is in 3D. Um, we are currently, Guanhua, <laughs> by we I mean Guanhua, is currently extending this to 3D. Uh, and in the process, he's controlling for what's called peripheral nerve stimulation. For those of you who don't know an MRI, if you vary the gradients too fast, the hardware has a limit, but people have a limit as well. If you vary the gradients too fast, you can actually uh, stimulate, uh, people react different way, little twitches or flashes of lights, and it's, it's not comfortable. People don't want this to happen. And so we're actually implementing another regularizer that uh, controls that so that we get trajectories that will be uh, both feasible for the hardware and uh, the software that's in the scanner. Um, we're, we're thinking about working on uh, the extension to 3D plus time. That has a number of challenges. Maybe uh, in the future, I'll talk to you about that more. So I think in summary, if you're, uh, I think I had the link. If you're interested in this, this is published. This is the code that's available. You're welcome to try it. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jeff, for the, this very nice talk. So we have a bit of time for questions. So I mean, two options for people in the, in the Zoom. So I, you can either put them on the chat and I read them, or you can raise your hand and then I can unmute you. So as you want. So we have a first question. Uh, we have a Two questions in the chat. So the first one for you, Jeff. So do you think uh, Bjork <laughs> would lend itself to Cartesian trajectory estimation as well, uh, for example, for EPI and spin warp imaging? Yeah, so uh, great question, Birkin. Thank you very much for it. Good to see you here. Um, if you're willing to move the phase and load locations to be arbitrary along the phase encoding axis, then we can apply it directly because then it's a essentially a non-Cartesian problem along the phase encoding location. Um, and we can apply our gradient descent techniques to that directly to those phase encode location parameters. If you wanna stick with the Cartesian locations, I think a different technique and I think some existing work. I'd, I'd be happy to hear if Guanhua has any ideas. To me, it's really fundamental different between choosing from a preset of specified distinct set of locations versus varying those locations continuously. And the, the work we did on the Jacobians and so on here is really designed for parameters that are varying continuously. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Uh, so who's raising your hand? So, okay. So maybe I read the second one in the chat and then we go to people who raised their hand. So, okay, thank you. So for, from Gastao Cruz, so thank you for the talk. How would you expect the optimal trajectories to vary with the underlying con contrast, for instance, immediately after an inversion, inversion pulse where the image polarity is flipped, should the new trajectory be the emission symmetric of the ideal trajectory? Um, I mean, that's an excellent question. My hunch, and I'm totally speculating here, is that it's 
not so specific to the contrast, right? The, 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 the contrast to me is kind of a low frequency feature. It's, it's the high resolution, the, the fine details of the anatomy, the structural details that I think we really need to learn the right sampling for. So again, I'm just conjecturing, but I would think contrast variations um, might not change the design as much. Um, uh, that's probably yeah, it. Can I suggest yeah, something? Yeah, please, please do go on. Uh, help me out. Yeah, uh, as we know, the first MRI data side has several contrasts. So we also try to learn the trajectory from different contrasts. And they look pretty similar from our BRI. And their reconstruction results are also very similar. So I guess uh, at least within the first MRI contrast, different contrasts will lead to very similar trajectories. And uh, maybe a good suggestion for us, Guan was to actually do a cross test, train on one contrast and test on the other. Right? You said they look similar. We could actually quantify that, right? By, by um, training on one and testing on the other. Um, and the specific question about would the trajectory be flipped, given that the method seems to be already learning a trajectory that sort of has a built-in conjugate symmetry-like property to it, my guess is it wouldn't need to flip. That's just speculating again. Thank you for that interesting question. Okay, so now for live question, Michael, you have, uh, you have one? Okay, so Jeff, uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Uh, so, so, so I will have two questions. Uh, the first, of course, is on the B-splines. <laughs> okay. And, yeah, yeah. That, no, no, but uh, so, so I, I, I think there's a very nice way to, to encode your trajectories. Now, there were just two things that were puzzling me. Okay. The first one, uh, I mean, would it be possible that uh, some of those trajectory, they, they cross? Because I, uh, I saw some examples. Y yes, it is possible. We, we think that's probably a local minimum in the, um, that's my speculation at least. I won't say we, I mm -hmm. think that when it does cross, uh, let me see here. I doubt that that's optimal, right? I would I would hunch that if we took some place where they're almost touching and maybe moved it over a little bit and reran the optimizer, I think it's unlikely it would want to move back over and touch, right? It just seems redundant to collect something that's so similar. So my guess that that's uh, a local minimizer. Uh, yeah, and, 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 uh, yeah. So the other thing is is that uh, they look so wiggly. Uh -huh. uh, and so, so is there some advantage? And, and the other thing, it also gives, so, so you're always collecting the same number of samples along those trajectories, or would you eventually sample, you know, at, at the constant rate and when they get wiggly, you get, take more samples? So they, they're sampled at a constant rate in time, right? The scanner has an A to D converter with, a, I think, a four microsecond yeah. um, dwell time, they call it, or sampling rate. So, uh, depending on the B spline coefficients, that can be non, definitely non uniform along the trajectory, right? And we, uh, we, don't re, we don't try to resample that or anything equally spaced in distance along the trajectory. They're just equally spaced on in time. And, and that's, I mean, the design process is consistent with what the scanner does in that regard, right? So, so I don't mm -hmm. think we, we wouldn't want to retrospectively perturb it because that I think that would be inconsistent with the, the training loss. Yeah, I don't know if that quite so, answers your question, yeah. Yeah, so, so does it mean that, uh, you know, for one of those trajectories, you always have get the same number of samples? Yes, that's correct. At least yeah, in the creative yeah, yeah, approach, okay, that, okay. that's correct, yes. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, and I mean, you have some explanation why a wigglier design, uh, you know, seems to emerge? Oh, um... Well, let me remind you that this is all done with multi-coil MRI, right? So in, in parallel MRI or multi-coil MRI, you have the effects of the sensitivity maps. Uh, and a simple way of thinking about this is that multiplying in the image domain by a coil sensitivity map is equivalent to convolving the case-based sampling with the, with the you know, Fourier transform of the sensitivity map. The sensitivity maps are very smooth, so their Fourier transform is very narrow, or pretty narrow. Um, but so there's really something complicated going on here, I think, between the trajectory and the effects of the spatial encoding you get from um, the, the sensitivity maps. And 
of course, you get that with the radial sampling as well, right? Even though these look like they're far apart, the effects of the coil is to somehow uh, get information in between there. So I, I don't think I have a great answer for why the wiggling helps as much as it does. If anybody else wants to jump in and comment, you're welcome to. Um, Okay, but, but anyway, so it seems to help. Uh, and that's yeah, exactly. the most important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So now a last question. It was about uh, uh, the MODL algorithm that you use, like yes. when you put the denoising neural network. Uh, do, is there any condition on, on the denoising network? Because, for example, there are like plug and play algorithms where you need to have like a Lipschitz constant that's smaller wow. or equal to one. Is there some condition like that for 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 convergence, or you 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 just use a, a denoiser without worrying too much? Right. So so those convergence conditions I think are important if you're going to run an arbitrarily large number of iterations. But this design process, we fix the number of outer iterations. And we're designing this trajectory is optimal for this number of iterations. And I'm pretty sure if you increase the number of iterations, it would no longer be optimal. And so because it's a fixed number of iterations, there are, are no constraints whatsoever on the, on the CNN weights. Um, the end-to-end -end learning's taken care of it. So, uh, and, and my guess is when this kind of method is deployed in practice, it's going to be with a fixed number of iterations. So I think there's really interesting theory about the convergence and what happens when you let the number of iterations go to infinity. But pra the practical importance of that here is maybe not so high. So, so anyway, short answer to your question is there's no, no Lipschitz constraints or anything going on here. Okay, so thank you very much. Fair question. Yep. Um, so Jeff, okay, if we take two more questions. Okay, yeah, I'm happy, sure. Uh, so one life, so uh, Thomas, I think you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the talk. So actually I had two um, questions. The first one would have been about, about the quadratic roughness that uh, mm -hmm. you used. So I know that in some other non-Cartesian uh, re uh, MRI reconstruction, they use some kind of uh, density compensation uh, before giving the input, so is, does it play the same role? Um, well, with greatly undersampled data, density compensation would be better. Th I, I mean, if, if you just did the inverse FFT or inverse adjoint NUFFT without density compensation, that would be a really terrible image. Um, density compensated would be better. Um, you still have the issue of multiple coils. You'd have to do coil combination. Um, I, th but I am confident that using this regularized method produces a better initial guess than even density compensated followed by the proper complex coil combination. I'm confident of that whether we actually compared it, I don't know. Guanwa, did we actually try uh, density compensated uh, zero field essentially reconstruction as initializer? Yeah, in our 3D experiment, we are trying to use uh, density compensating function, but for the 2D, we are using a regularized uh, reconstruction as the initial initializer. And probably the reason we're doing it the other way in 3D is because it's faster, right? So it's a great question you're asking, because if it's good enough to do it with density compensation, then that'll, that'll save us both forward and back propagation time. So we will definitely be looking into that more as we go to higher dimensions and greater com compute complexity. So great question you asked there. So because the second part of my question is also, be, I know that the sparkling um, the, the group with Sparkling use this kind of compensations and also they have a, a follow-up work where they optimize a bit their trajectories and actually in, in what they get, uh, they get very unstructured looking patterns that, ha that are actually overlapping a lot. Interesting. So I was wondering if uh, from your results, uh, could it be that this spline parameterization would actually be a bit too restrictive given that they have very good results that overlap a lot. And do you have suggestions of what uh, kind of param other parameterization maybe you could use? So uh, first of all, uh, although we're using splines, it's a separate spline for each of the spokes. And so therefore there's no constraint that it's allowed to overlap. We're not putting any kind of potential functions or anything to push them apart, right? So to, to, um, 
That's the optimizer is doing whatever it needs to do. I do want to comment that our comparison to sparkling are with the sort of classic sparkling that has that's based on a pre-specified density function. I know that in more recent work that they're they're doing more learning themselves, and we haven't compared to their most recent work. Um, so I don't think the splines are preventing from crossing. So if if um, if crossing is beneficial. I think this algorithm could uh, eventually get there. Maybe we would need to go to perhaps even finer spacing and maybe run it longer if that evolution. So I think what, what you're really saying is we need to do that head-to-head -head comparison of their crossing trajectories versus ours on same set of data set. And we haven't done that yet. Yeah, no, it, it, was, it was merely just that I was very surprised when I saw their paper with the yeah, crossing yeah. trajectories. So I was wondering if you had some insight, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just I, very I, recent. Yeah, I'm surprised as well. So yes. thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So my guess is that in the updated paper, the readout uh, readout time is still longer. So their trajectory can afford the time to cross each other. Ah. Um, but in the results we are showing here, the readout time is pretty, pretty short. So you know you cannot have a very global optimization here because uh, you are constrained by the gradient strength and smooth rate. Yeah, yeah I think okay. That's, that's an important point. The, these radial ones were only 2.5 milliseconds, and I see that I forgot to include some spiral results in the question in the in the talk. Sorry about that. You can refer to our paper to see the spiral results. Okay, this makes a lot of sense. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so and one last question from the chat. So from Martin McTegal. So how strong was the effect of initializing with radials compared to initializing with a spiral? Yeah, so uh, quite strong, I think. Uh, I could try to bring up the paper and show that. Uh, Guanwa, do you want to comment while I'm? Uh... <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't quite get the uh, question. Uh, I mean, I mean the, re the the results for for spirals look a lot different than the ones for radial, right? Yeah. But our paper does not include a figure for the oh, optimal. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, so so uh, I think the short answer, it has a strong effect. This is a very non-convex problem. And even with the course defined search we're doing with the B splines, we're getting a better local minimizer, but we I'm sure we're not getting a global minimizer. And that would be a with the with a million more than a hundred million neural network parameters and whatever, tens of thousands of or thousands of whatever spline parameters, we're never going to find that. So it so that is a reason to continue being smart about how we initialize, right? Based on the kind of MRI physics we know about the properties of radial and spiral and other kinds of trajectories. I think we can't let machine learning do all the job. We still need to have some human intelligence to mix in with the AI. Maybe that can be my parting thought.